Vibe Family, it's Michael here. Hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. Um, I'm filming this a few days before Thanksgiving, which is crazy to me that we're already here. Um, but because it's Thanksgiving weekend coming up, we will not be doing our revived Zoom meeting this Saturday. Our next meeting will actually be on December 5th. Um, and there will be another devotional that comes up before then. So stay tuned for that and we'll remind you about it as the day gets closer. For this week's devotional, uh, I'll be continuing on in the series about family that Pastor Lauren started a few weeks ago. And for this one, I wanted to focus on this idea of our expectations, our expectations of each other and of our family members in particular. Uh, chances are that you'll be interacting with family in some way or another during the holidays, whether it's in person or virtual. Um, and many of us go into these interactions having some expectations. They could be feelings of excitement, anticipation, also maybe feelings of stress and anxiety. I wanna take some time to think about what's sitting underneath those expectations. And I wanna highlight three things that I think really can feed into those. So those three things are our assumptions, our interpretations, and our underlying beliefs. Now our assumptions are often not based in direct evidence, tangible things that we're seeing right in front of us, um, but we're pulling on our prior knowledge about somebody and our past experience with them. And so uh, an example of this would be, you know, you know uh, that you and this family member, let's say an uncle or something, uh, have different political views. And we just got through an election cycle and you've also remembered that a few years ago there was a little bit of a tense interaction with this person before about politics. And so now you're just kind of assuming uh, that interacting with them this year is gonna be a little awkward, a little tense. So that's assumptions. Interpretations, on the other hand, are based in the tangible things that we're seeing right in front of us, but it's assigning meaning and significance to those things that we're seeing. So an example of this would be, uh, you text one of your family members, a cousin or something, and they don't respond and you interpret that to mean that they are mad at you or that they don't care about you uh, something like that and then the last one is our underlying beliefs and these are the deepest and they develop over time but these are really the narratives and the stories that we play in our head about our family members um, how they think what they believe about us. Um, and so that can range from anything from my grandparents favor me, like I'm their favorite grandchild, to something like, uh, you know, my parents, I think deep down, think that I'm a failure. Um, and so these three things, our assumptions, our interpretations, and our beliefs, all ladder up into uh, the kinds of expectations that we have um, going into these interactions with each other. And uh, these are very normal things. We all need to make uh, assumptions and interpretations and we all need to have beliefs. Uh, that's how we move in the world and make decisions. But they're not always accurate. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over a story in the Bible that's actually a very long story. Um, most of you are probably familiar with it. There's a, in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, uh, there's a story of two brothers, uh, Jacob and Esau. And uh, if you know the story, uh, Esau was born first. Um, and so he was this, the son that was kind of entitled to this blessing from his father Isaac, um, but in the story, Jacob actually tricks Isaac 
into giving him the blessing instead of Esau. And Esau becomes furious and wants to kill Jacob. So Jacob has to run away. And then many years later, God tells Jacob uh, that it's time to, to go home. And so Jacob, knowing that Esau is still there, he sends messengers to Esau to tell him that where Jacob has been and to try and garner some favor from him. And then the messengers come back and they tell Jacob, oh, your brother Esau, he's coming to meet you and he's bringing 400 men. And immediately Jacob is in distress. He's imagining that Esau is coming to kill him uh, because obviously that's what he wanted to do before. Um, and so he, he starts making these strategies. He's like dividing up his people into like this half and this half so that if Esau comes, takes this half and the other half can escape. Um, he starts sending gifts ahead to Esau to appease him. Um, and then in chapter 33 of Genesis, when the two actually meet, it's not at all what Jacob had expected. Um, he, he's coming and he's bowing and basically asking for Esau's favor. And then Esau just runs to him and embraces him and kisses him. And, and the two of them, the two brothers, they just weep together. And it's clear that Esau did not come to do any harm to Jacob, but he came to be reunited with him. And so these, you know, you can see the ways that Jacob had assumptions and interpretations and beliefs uh, about what that interaction was gonna look like and that fed into his expectations going into meeting with his brother. He was assuming that Esau was still mad at him. He was interpreting that the 400 men were there to, you know, as an army to come and take them down. And it really stemmed from this underlying belief that Esau viewed him as his enemy. And so, you know, on the one hand, it, this story, I would encourage you to read it. Um, it is a, a beautiful picture of um, what it looks like for these two brothers to, on the surface, look like they're reconciled. Um, and there's this, this wonderful line that J Jacob says where he's, he's telling Esau to take the gifts that he's given him uh, because finding this favor with him is, is like seeing the face of God. But I, if you read a little bit further in the story, uh, there's actually some hints uh, that the writer gives us that maybe Jacob still didn't fully accept that Esau had forgiven him. Um, because after they embrace and um, are reunited, then Esau says, all right, let's 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 go home together um, to our, our the hometown of, of Seir. And then uh, <laughs> Jacob tells Esau, okay, you, you go on ahead and, and we'll stay, we'll, we'll follow you guys in the back because I got these women and children, they're gonna be slow. And then Esau's like, oh, okay, uh, why don't you let me give you some of our men and, and they'll help you out. And then Jacob's like, no, 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 you don't, you don't need to do that. And then, then it actually says that, uh, okay, Esau went back to, to Seir where they're from. And then Jacob went the other way. He went to this other place, Sakoth which is in the opposite direction. Um, and so even though there's nothing in the text to indicate that Esau's reaction and receiving of Jacob was anything but genuine, there are these hints that maybe it was still hard for Jacob to accept that his brother had changed, that Esau wasn't the man uh, years ago that wanted to kill him. And I bring this story up because uh, I think it's easy for us to do the same. We have these narratives and these assumptions and, and these ways of interpreting our, the, the actions of our family members and we end up putting them in a box. We think that because these things happened before, because we've seen how our family has been before, 
that that's just what things are gonna look like. That's just who they are. But the reality is that we as human beings, we're not static people. We're dynamic, we change, God changes us. But it can be hard for us to see that in each other and particularly in our family members. I think when our underlying beliefs about them develop over such a long time and they become so ingrained in our minds that it's hard to see the reality of who that person truly is, of how God actually sees them. But the thing that is clear from the passage is that Esau, he did change. He was not the same person he was uh, when he wanted to kill Jacob. But could it be that Jacob's underlying assumptions and beliefs and his expectations about Esau prevented him from fully seeing that change happen? Maybe. And I think the same can be true of us as well. Sometimes when we hold on to the narratives that we have developed too strongly, we can actually become blind to the movement of God in the lives of our loved ones. So the, the challenge I wanna give us is, is not to get rid of our assumptions and our interpretations and our beliefs. No, we need them but we need to hold them a little loosely and that the the invitation is actually to to pause and to take a step back and and reflect and ask ourselves what are those assumptions that i'm making what are the, how am i interpreting what my family members are doing and even more deeply what are those underlying beliefs that i'm holding on to that are then impacting my expectations and the way that I'm choosing to interact with them. And my hope is that as we do that, that God would actually open us up to the ways um, to seeing maybe where we're, we're getting it right, but maybe where we're getting it wrong. And to be open to the possibility that we don't have the full picture of what God is doing in um, our family members' lives. And as we do that, uh, I think that God could actually begin to impart to us what his heart is for our family, what his, how he views our family members, not as static people, but as dynamic, as people that change, as people that he is transforming to the movement that God is doing in the lives of our family members. So brothers and sisters and, and friends, and uh, I encourage us to take time before we meet with our family to, to sit back and pause and think about what our expectations are of them and to invite God to opening our eyes and our hearts to seeing them the way that he sees them. And as we do that, I pray that that we would actually be filled with a greater sense of empathy, a greater sense of compassion, and a greater sense of love for our family and our friends around us. Grace and peace to you, my friends.